bem-vindos a São Carlos, o Instituto de Química de São Carlos, da Universidade de São Paulo. Tenho o prazer de organizar hoje a sétima edição do Encontro Especial em Química Medicinal, é, que tem sido é, organizado desde o seu primórdio pelo é, professor Andrei e por mim. E este ano é, nós vamos ter uma é, sessão bastante é, interessante com vários convidados estrangeiros e também vários brasileiros. Então, inicialmente, eu gostaria de agradecer a presença de todos vocês por virem aqui prestigiar o nosso é, evento. Eu gostaria de sugerir a vocês que é, estejam e se sintam é, verdadeiramente confortáveis em casa é, para participar do evento, perguntar. É muito importante é, fazer perguntas, mesmo que, eventualmente, a pergunta não seja aquela pergunta, mas não tenha receio, faça é, perguntas, que é muito importante que você é, faça perguntas. Por causa da natureza do evento, é, eu vou mudar para o inglês, porque é, nós vamos é, ter as apresentações na língua inglesa e eu espero que vocês também aproveitem essa oportunidade para treinar o é, é, inglês. Mas, se no momento da pergunta você ficar um pouco tímido e quiser fazer um pouco em português, está cheio de brasileiro aqui, que é, eventualmente poderá é, te ajudar. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. It's my great pleasure to uh, declare open this uh, session for the seventh edition of the São Carlos Special Medicinal Chemistry Meeting. We've been organized this meet, Professor Andre and me, for uh, quite a while already. Uh, and we have seen some development along the years. And uh, we find that it is uh, very important to keep going with this uh, meet, mostly because our intention is to bring our students to this uh, great field that is medicinal chemistry. And as you know, medicinal chemistry is an area where we uh, have to do a very nice and very tough work in order to uh, help to contribute to the discovery of new medicines. Though this is not uh, quite easy, but uh, we have to be strong and try to do and get collaboration. So because of this, we have some men friends here from abroad and also from this country. We're going to speak for us today and tomorrow and also uh, on Wednesday. Uh, also, uh, besides the uh, talkings, we, we're going to have two workshops and I hope you can uh, enjoy. One of these workshops will uh, be about some, you know, how it was modeling for small molecules and to uh, design our bioactive new chemical entities. And uh, the other one will be performed uh, on a doc doctor that is a docking program that has been developed by Professor Lohan uh, here in Brazil. And if I'm not mistaken, it is the first docking package that we have uh, in Brazil that it, to imitate some of our friends speaks Portuguese, but it's everything is written in English and in English anyway. But the program that uh, the program is 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 really very nice. Uh, we have very nice speakers for today and tomorrow and Wednesday, and I hope you can come and, and enjoy uh, with us uh, these uh, three days of uh, program. Our program is. Our idea for this program was to uh, get. Uh, speakers talking in the morning about their uh, works. And here in yellow, you, you see uh, the speakers who are going to speak uh, as invited uh, speakers and plenary rectories uh, speakers. And then in the afternoon, we will have all these talkings from uh, students who have applied for doing that. Uh, we are trying to do something a bit different this time and have no poster sessions. Uh, and the idea behind this is to give you an opportunity to come a meeting like this and to speak. We know, of course, that it is very important to have a poster session because, unfortunately, we cannot invite every single person to come and speak. But the way this meeting is organized is actually uh, due to uh, go this way. So 
thank you very much for you guys who have offered your abstracts to be uh, presented here in these uh, meetings. So uh, I think we uh, have to go on and we're gonna have our first speaker uh, today that is Professor Michael Gucho. And I would like to uh, invite my colleague, Dr. Peter Kenny, to uh, introduce him. So thank you very much for coming to San Carlos. Enjoy it. We have some very nice beers around here. So do take the opportunity to uh, test taste then that it's very nice and I hope you have uh, we enjoyed the meeting as well and if we need anything just talk to Vinicius and the other people Rafael uh, to whom I should you know acknowledge that these guys have done the massive work to put this on and I'll have also to thank uh, Professor Jerónimo Lamera who is a visiting researcher in our lab and also Professor Ende these are the guys who did the job I didn't do anything I'm just here with this mic now but uh, uh, they have done a very, very nice job and I appreciate that very much. And uh, I think you're gonna enjoy the selection of the speakers that they have for these three days meetings. So enjoy. Peter. Mic's on? Yeah, okay, great. Um, so our first speaker is uh, Professor Mikhail Gucho, um, and he has a bachelor's degree in biochemistry and a PhD in pharmaceutical chemistry from the Le University of Leipzig in Germany. Uh, he's currently a professor at the University of Bonn, also in Germany. He has experience in the area of medicinal chemistry, working on many topics such as inhibitors of proteases and esterases, new targets and mechanisms, molecular modeling, and molecular biological techniques. Professor Gucho will present the work uh, Novel Cathepsin B Inhibitors with Inversely Oriented Warheads. Professor Gucho. So thank you, Peter, for the nice introduction. And in particular, I would like to thank Carlos for inviting me. It's a great pleasure to be here. And I really enjoy uh, this conference. And I would like to show you some uh, data that are related to uh, catepsin B. This is an enzyme, and we are uh, interested in uh, developing inhibitors for this enzyme. It's a cysteine protease, and I selected this topic uh, for this speech today. So first, uh, let's have a look at uh, our university. Uh, this is not the building of our institute. I didn't show our institute. It's not that nice. This is the, ma the main building. Uh, it is not, uh, has not been constructed uh, for, to be a university building, but it was a palace of a bishop, and later on it was given to the University of Bonn. And then there is a, a nice alley from this building, and then you reach the second palace that is also belonging to the University of Bonn. It's the place where our faculty of natural sciences and mathematics can be found. So we do not work there, we only have uh, boring meetings over there. But in front of this building, um, there's an institute, and you probably know this person, that's Kekule, and he was the head of the chemistry institute a long time ago in Bonn. And he, uh, this Kekule is very famous for inventing the uh, structure of benzene. So the benzene structure is a six-member drink, and you here see Kekule uh, just a few seconds before he did this great invention. Obviously, it was not that difficult uh, to come up uh, with a six-member drink because he's just surrounded by six-member drinks at all. So, uh, concerning structures, uh, I would like to introduce the structures of our target enzymes, catepsins. So first, uh, please have in mind these are uh, human enzymes that are stored in lysosomes, and these are cysteine proteases. So here you have the active site cysteine that uh, is a residue whose nucleophilicity is uh, improved due to the neighboring histidine that belongs to the different part, different domain of the enzyme. There's an active site cleft over here where the substrate can be bound. And uh, actually, um, these uh, cysteine and the histidine form a tiolate imidacyl pair that is very important for the catalytic event that occurs. So this is, shows you a scheme when a substrate is bound to a cysteine protease. So that picture might be very familiar for most of you. And the um, catalytic 
um, machinery includes uh, a nucleophilic attack of the active site cysti on the carbonyl carbon of the cisyl bond. And this is a process that can be described as acyl transfer. So the act uh, nucleophilic attack led to the formation of the first product and to a a uh, covalently bound acyl enzyme. And now in the second step, of course, water comes in the game because these are hydrolytic events that need water and water is uh, cleaving uh, the uh, thioester bond uh, in a very fast because this second step is evolutionary supported to be very fast. I come back to this uh, idea. And then when the second product is formed, a new substrate can be bound to the active site of the cysteine catepsin. So catepsin B, the selected target is a validated target uh, for the treatment of uh, uh, cancer diseases because it's involved in the pathophysiology of tumor growth and uh, invasion. And uh, it is um, an enzyme that is secreted by tumor cells. And once secreted, um, this uh, enzyme can degrade components of the extracellular matrix. It can liberate angiogenic and uh, growth factors. Uh, it can activate other proteases. And uh, the uh, corresponding factors can then interact with uh, receptors on endothelial cells. And then uh, tumor cells can invade, actually, and uh, new blood vessels can be formed. And that can even lead to uh, um, uh, metastasis. So the involvement of CAT-B in these processes makes this enzyme to be a target for the development of enzyme inhibitors. So how you can receive an inhibitor from the substrate structure, that is actually not so difficult. Uh, so here you have a substrate and the, again the attack of the active site cysteine at the sisal bond. And if you would now, uh, for example, replace this amide structure uh, by a nitrile, then you already have a peptidic nitrile inhibitor. And this has been discovered long ago in a, a pioneer work uh, from the Henslick lab. And later on, it has been used for several attempts, including a few that I have noted here from our lab uh, to uh, um, design this type of uh, nitrile-based peptidic inhibitors. The interaction has been shown to be covalent, forming this thioimidate adapt, but reversible. That is important, covalent and irreversible. Um, so if you are more interested in the uh, importance of nitrile-type peptides uh, for the design of and for the selectivity of cysteine protease inhibitors, I would like to draw your attention uh, to uh, a recent uh, perspective article um, um, that uh, is coming from uh, Carlos Montanari's lab together with uh, some uh, co-workers that are also around here. And uh, uh, first also is Dr. Uh, Lorenzo Ciani, who, the great, uh, who had his defense um, a few days ago. And we also uh, have uh, collected some data for a, a review article that is more related to the mapping of catepsin B, but it has also a, a kind of a connection to nitrile uh, inhibitors. So then we wanted to address the question whether it would be possible to replace the uh, carbon with the attached hydrogen over here in this type of inhibitors by a nitrogen that led to the uh, discovery of a new chemotype of uh, um, peptidic um, cysteine protease inhibitors that we call the ASA dipeptide nitriles. And the interaction is similar. Uh, again, uh, we have a reversible covalent mechanism, and these stabilized isothiosemicarbocyte derivatives can be formed. And then I would like to show you um, older data uh, from a first series of this uh, type of compounds, mainly in order to uh, demonstrate how I'd like to present our data in the following minutes. So these columns are PKI values, meaning the, the longer the column, the higher the column, the more potent the inhibitor is. So all this column stands for inhibition of a certain enzyme by a certain inhi inhibitor. And the different colors of the columns represent our target enzymes. So the blue 
um, colors are uh, catepsin B, the enzyme that I have already introduced. Red stands for cat L, an enzyme that is mainly also involved in tumor progression. Catepsin S is a uh, catepsin that plays a role in um, the immune system. And finally, green color for cat K. This enzyme is quite prominent as a target for um, treatment attempts against osteoporosis. So it's connected to bone remodeling and bone degradation. So you can imagine if you have such a number of data, you can nicely draw structure activity relationships. And I will only show you a few of them. For example, if you take this single compound, um, it has a leucine in P2 position, and it has these acer alanine in a P1 position. And all these compounds, B a methyl group, B on those peptide bond, this is for reasons of the chemical uh, synthesis, and the nitrile warhead terminating it at the C-terminal part. This is a general inhibitor for all these four enzymes. As you see, the columns are similarly large here. And then another compound has um, glycine in um, P2 position. So the P2 position is important in case of cysteine proteases. And this compound is actually not active. This nicely shows that this chemotype does not only work because of the power of the warhead, it actually has the warhead, it also works because of the specific interactions, non-covalent interactions in particular with the uh, P2 amino acid residue and the corresponding S2 binding <coughs> pocket of the target enzyme. Another compound has a, a typical um, P2 uh, residue um, that was uh, designed in order to inhibit catepsin S, and it works together with inhi inhibition of uh, CAT-K. Uh, this compound um, shows uh, a tri arrow motive at the C-terminal part that turned out to be very advantageous in our case. And then I have a further picture for you uh, with uh, a compound that has a building block of balikatib. This is a uh, cysteine protease inhibitor that has not been developed by us, but by Merck, and we put it into this chemotype of um, acyl dipeptide nitriles. And since um, this um, moiety um, uh, provides selectivity for cut K, we can also found that here. Uh, and finally, then we combined uh, this building block with our tree aryl motive, um, and then uh, we received a very potent and very selective inhibitor for cat K in this case. This compound has a picomolar KI value and has a nice selectivity for more than, uh, of more than 24 with respect to the other highly related enzymes. Uh, we also introduced um, a fluorescence label to these compounds, um, and uh, I will come back to this later on. Um, if you would have a covalent inhibitor, you might consider uh, the development of an activity-based probe. But since I told you that the uh, nitriles are versatile, so they are not very well suited to make uh, activity-based probes. And uh, so we had later on, I will show that, to introduce a different type of warhead for this approach. So um, this shows how the um, ASR dipeptide nitriles are expected to bind in the active site of a target enzyme. And you see they are addressing as one pocket, as two pocket, and probably as three, as four pockets, but they do not address the prime site of the target. So is it possible? Uh, yes. Uh, we, we, we try to uh, make compounds of that type, which have the uh, warhead more or less in the middle of the inhibitor structure, and the structure is then extended to both sides, also able to uh, interact with the binding pocket of the prime side of the, the target. And this is a small series of compounds that follow this type. Um, the first one uh, has um, still a methyl group here at the carbamate, was not so active, then replaced, uh, replaced the methyl by hydrogen. Uh, that led to an already potent compound. And next, uh, what we did was um, stepwise um, uh, uh, introducing uh, aromatic moieties on the eastern part. Uh, and we could further improve the activity very nicely. And finally, we came up with a compound that has a single digit picomolar KI value and a very nice uh, selectivity for 
our target at that time, which was catapsin K. So I have already mentioned activity-based probes for cysteine proteases, and I would like to show you very quickly that we are also interested in this uh, type of uh, compounds and in this technique. So for, uh, I would like to introduce that to you. Um, if you would have a mixture of um, proteins, uh, including your target, which might be a catepsin, uh, you might design a compound that is labeled for example with biotin or fluorescent label, and it should be selective, and then uh, the corresponding probe would only interact with your target, not with the other proteins out of a mixture of proteins. And then you can use the label for electrophoresis, and you can separate the proteins. You might then have a uh, only one band, but in this case three, because maybe of uh, non-specific interactions. And this shows a compound that has been made uh, following this uh, idea. It uh, does have a warhead, uh, but uh, the warhead is no longer a nitrile. And this is a vinyl sulfone that is known to interact in an irreversible way. It has a corresponding part for affinity and then a fluorescent label. And uh, this can be then uh, react with the exocyte cysteine in a nucleophilic addition reaction this time. So uh, the double bond is no longer there. The exocyte cysteine was adding at the beta position here of this microacceptor system. And then you can use that for a labeling and detection of the target enzymes. So the um, interesting fluorophore of this compound was uh, developed in a collaboration with a group in Russia and uh, the final, actually, um, the idea was to introduce the fluorophore of the green fluorescence protein. This is the green fluorescence protein. You know this, of course. And uh, if you ha would have a closer insight into this protein, you would find uh, uh, this fluorophore here. Uh, it is formed in an autocatalytic reaction in which three amino acid residues are involved. And it can only be formed at the specific environment of these a typical structure of GFP. So if you then do the next step and you, you would uh, take out this structure and make this simple compound here, what you would find is no fluorescence at all. This is not a fluorescent compound um, because it can rotate around this bond here and this rotation has to be uh, prevented. The compound has to be locked. So this is one approach with uh, co coordination via zinc or introducing of a borane. And this is the, the uh, fluorophore that has been um, uh, produced by our colleagues in Moscow. And we consider this to be the closest relative of the natural um, green fluorescence protein fluorophore. So we can probably call that attempt the chemical introduction of the green fluorescence uh, into a protein, not via um, molecular biology, but via chemistry. So you see the uh, fluorescence labeling of uh, the corresponding um, CAT-K. Um, this is uh, if you uh, incubate CAT-K alone or with the probe, you see the same band. Uh, if you spike uh, a mixture of proteins, a lysate from hex cells or with CAT-K and uh, incubate it with the probe, you have the same band. But if in, the, in the absence of uh, CAT-K, you won't see a band because these uh, hex cells do not produce catepsin K. Uh, this shows Western blood, a similar uh, uh, result. And we can actually uh, realize that our uh, technique is comparable to Western blotting. And on the right, um, you have uh, a Kumasi uh, detection of all the proteins. And here you see the uh, uh, Cat K alone. And this is um, Cat K. Cat K together with the protein mixture of, out of the heclysate, and you might uh, appreciate that this is a really a high number of proteins inside this mixture, but only one has detected by our probe. So let me come back to this scheme, uh, and uh, let, uh, let's have a look to the um, catalytic side of cysteine uh, catapsins. And again, um, I would like to show you um, the same story uh, in case of the... Um, Catepsin B, and catepsin B has a unique structural feature. This is uh, the uh, so-called occluding loop that mainly uh, includes two uh, protonated uh, emitter cells of histidine residues. And uh, in this so-called uh, locked conformation, where the uh, occluding loop is uh, 
shifted towards the active site cleft. Uh, um, the uh, enzyme does not, no longer have an endopeptidase um, activity, but a carboxydipeptidase activity. Uh, so since there's no more space here than for two amino acids, and here then the cleavage occurs to release a dipeptide and later on hydrolysis uh, forms the second product. So we were thinking about of the utilization of this specific feature in order to make selective compounds for catalyst um, So this has all already been uh, uh, also con considered by other groups. And uh, a very well-known example of this is uh, the uh, uh, CaO74 compound. It has a warhead in form of an epoxide. This is electrophilic over here. And the structure, the pept peptide structure is extended to the prime site. And there might be an interaction of, with the occluding loop of this free carboxylate. And then um, I have discussed that uh, with colleagues also already the days before. Uh, Shashke has uh, uh, expanded uh, this idea and uh, also included uh, um, a peptide portion to the N-terminal part now with, um, to make a compound that uh, is... Uh, addressing the, the whole um, active site region over here uh, with the electrophilic void in the middle. This compound would not be cleaved. Um, uh, the compound would not cleave, but only what this, the cleavage would only occur here in the epoxide portion of the inhibitor. So this is one approach that has been published by Greenspan a few years ago. And uh, um, this time, the occluding loop is also... Uh, addressed by a certain portion of the inhibitor. It's a nitrile-based inhibitor again. And then via an ether linkage, the car uh, carboxylate can reach the uh, uh, occluding loop that way. And we did a similar approach uh, with click chemistry. Uh, um, and uh, we kept the nitrile over here. And we introduced this acidic moiety via click chemistry to this serine type uh, uh, portion of the inhibitor. And uh, then. Uh, I would like to switch to new compounds um, that I uh, would like to show you. And I would like to uh, um, convince you that they also uh, interact in a similar manner with the uh, carboxylate of these P2 prime amino acids interacting with the occluding loop. And then we have this um, P1 prime position. And we have a warhead that is uh, a carbamate. And now we have the warhead on the N-terminal part of the peptide, so this has a different orientation with respect to, to the usual orientation of a warhead. So we call this uh, type of compounds those with inversely oriented warheads. How to make the compounds? This is the, the easiest way for our first series of these uh, carbamates. So we started with the um, um, P1 prime amino acid in a set protected form, coupled it with the tertiary butyl ester of the P2 prime amino acid, this is the, the amide bond that has to be formed. Uh, and then we have the dipeptide. The dipeptide is then deprotected to uh, receive the free amino group. That can then be reacted with uh, chloroformates uh, to produce the corresponding carbamate structure. And finally, we deprotect the tertiary butyl ester to uh, come up with the free acid that is expected to be important for interaction with the occluding loop. So these are the these type of uh, compounds that I'd like to uh, show you now in more detail. And uh, of course, you can imagine that such a kind of simple peptide chemistry can also be, be done uh, on uh, corresponding uh, solid uh, phase resins. Uh, and this shows the same, uh, in principle, the same uh, synthetic uh, route to uh, produce the free acid after cleavage from the resin. And this time, of course, we have uh, employed FMOC protecting chemistry. Uh, this is not an amino acid, but an hydroxy acid. Otherwise, it looks like leucine, but leucine would have an NH2 group over here. We had to uh, in introduce that as well. And uh, so we uh, coupled the carboxylate uh, with a, a tertiary butyl ester of proline and made the carbamate um, with an isocyanate. So you have to notice that these nitrogen and oxygen have changed their positions in this type of carbamate, and then we deprotect it. I come back to this structure. Uh, the compounds behave as irreversible inhibitors. So if you would uh, follow the uh, pr processing of the substrate uh, without inhibitor, you would receive this uh, progress curve. And in uh, higher concentrations of the inhibitor, these uh, 
time-dependent inhibition already indicates an irreversible uh, mode of inhibition. Then you can take out the uh, first-order rate constants and plot the first-order rate constants against the inhibitor concentration, and then you can come up with a second-order rate constant. And I will take this second-order rate constant numbers and convert them to corresponding uh, negative logarithm values, uh, and then I show you these values again in columns, meaning the higher the column, the better potent the compound is. So this is the first, we made a lot of this type of compounds, and you already have a hit over here. Uh, please be aware of the numbers here. We are around a number of thousand. Uh, this has phenylalanine in, in um, P2 prime position and leucine in uh, P1 prime position. Uh, so if we introduce the tertiary butyl ester over here, we lost activity. If we replace chlorine by hydrogen, we lost activity. And if then again introduced the uh, tertiary butyl ester, um, of course, no inhibition would be formed, uh, found. And this is uh, already indicating that there is a leaving group capability needed for activity since the chlorine would improve the leaving group capability of this uh, phenolic moiety. We took this same compound, uh, we, uh, we, we measured all our compounds at four different enzymes. They were not active against CAT-L, they were not active against cat s they were not active against CAT-K, so all these nice colors that are introduced uh, are no longer needed, unfortunately, uh, because the other compound that I would like to show, they are also not active at the three other enzymes, only at our target, only at the blue color, only at cat b uh, this shows um, that we have now, again, uh, phenylalanine in um, P2 prime and leucine. And here we have changed the structure. It looks like leucine, but if you have a closer insight, you see this is a beta amino acid with the defined stereochemistry, not so easy to make. Uh, we were asked to make this structure by our colleagues from uh, the uh, computational chemistry. They ex ex so we expected uh, uh, improvement of uh, affinity here to improve it because we expanded the distance between this position and the leaving group position, but we lost affinity. We also introduced a, a triple bond for, for a click chemistry approach and corresponding affinity-based probes, but we lost activity. And this shows that also a methyl ester in comparison to the free acid is not active. So it's not the size of the ester, it's the the fact that this methyl ester cannot form an an anionic carboxylate that matters. Uh, then uh, I already have uh, um, uh, compounds that ha are active. For example, this one here has uh, the uh, uh, isoleucine, but it could even improve the activity with cyclohexyl uh, uh, glycine or cyclohexyl alanine. So these two compounds uh, 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 seems to be very active and uh, nice starting point for further optimization. Otherwise, the phenylalanine is kept constant here in this four acids. So this moiety with cyclohexylalanine and uh, in uh, P1 prime and phenylalanine in P2 prime was then considered to do best motive on the uh, C-terminal uh, part of the inhibitors. And now we wanted to improve um, the uh, corresponding western part of those compounds. Um, so this is the... Uh, typical um, uh, carbamate structure, and it uh, led to an active compound. Uh, this is urea, and in case of urea, otherwise it's the same. Uh, we did not have affinity. If we methylate the carbamate, we do not have uh, activity, and if we change the places of oxygen and nitrogen, we do not have affinity. So this clearly shows that this actually the leaving group is important, and the leaving group is only here where the phenolate can act as the leaving group. In the other cases, you won't have a nice leaving group. So this is pointed into the direction that the mechanism of interaction would be E1CB, that is uh, the postulated mechanism for these uh, inhibitors. So then we uh, went away and introduced amide bonds in para position and in meta position with these proline leucine type of compounds. And, uh, and here we added a chlorine in meta, and uh, then we get better in, in inhibition, and here we added the chlorine in para. So this was already a very promising compound. Please note that I have changed the axis here. We are already with, uh, with numbers of around 3,000. 
then we uh, added larger biphenyl type amide bonds with chlorine and para. And you show this, see this is an uh, inhibitor, tertiary butyl ester is not. And here we use this phenylacetic amide structure. The acid is active, the tertiary butyl ester is not. And uh, then we put the chlorine in meta. Here's the tertiary butyl ester, no activity. Here's the free acid activity. And we have this biphenyl um, formul amino. And this shows uh, that it is also uh, helpful to have this branched biphenyl acetyl amino structure, um, uh, which uh, led to a strong inhibition already, uh, whereas the tertiary butyl ester is much less active. And here we have just monophenyl acetyl amino. It's nearly potent, no activity for the tertiary butyl ester. So we took this structure here as the optimized moiety for the left-hand side part of the um, uh, compounds. And now we had to combine our two optimized structures. This was the one that I already mentioned for the, uh, the C-terminal right part. Uh, this was the one for the N-terminal uh, left-hand part. And we combined both uh, uh, fragments to our best inhibitor um, that has uh, an, um, a very nice uh, uh, second order rate constant of around 14,000 per molar per second. So this was uh, our optimized compound, finally. So how to make these uh, compounds? It's not so easy than the initial synthesis that I showed. Uh, so first we combined the uh, set protected um, P1 prime amino acid with the uh, tertiary ester of the uh, P2 prime amino acid to the, to the peptide. Then we deprotected the uh, NH2 group. And on the other hand, we took this d acetic acid, uh, coupled is, is via the mixed anhydride technique uh, to an anisidine anis moiety that has a protected uh, phenolic group and chlorine in meter. Then we deprotected it to come up with the free phenol. And now we have to connect the amino group and the phenol group uh, to a carbamate. So what we had to do now is introducing a CO unit. And that was finally uh, uh, um, attained with the help of Trifos gene under conditions that I have mentioned here. So this is the crucial and most difficult step of the whole synthesis to produce the carbamate. That, and later on, of course, in the next step, we deprotected uh, the uh, tertiary ester to make the free acid. What is the postulated mode of action of these uh, uh, compounds? I have already uh, told you a little bit. E1CB, that's what I have mentioned. And we expected the inhibition as follows. So the active site cysteine is deprotonated, it's a thiolate. And usually this moiety acts as a nucleophile in an interaction process with uh, inhibitors and substrates. But in our case, we expected it uh, to act as a base. So what are bases doing? Bases are taking protons. If the cysteine, uh, an ion, uh, would attract the proton from the carbamate, uh, the structure would immediately becoming uh, um, instable and uh, undergoes uh, E1CB. This is the corresponding B base, which is CB, corresponding base. The, the uh, E1CB mechanism can immediately occur, and an isocyanate can be formed at the peptide portion, and the phenolate is repulsed as the leaving group. That is the situation over here. Then the leaving group would be would getting protonated, and the nucleophilic attack at the isocyanate would occur. So in the second uh, stage of this process, our active site cysteine would act as a nucleophile, as expected. Well, that would uh, finally lead us to a very special situation. This kind of uh, tyourethane uh, connection of the C-terminal part of the inhibitor to the active site cysteine of the enzyme. And so this is a structure that cannot easily get cleaved because it's not supported by evolution. So evolution that, that does not know this situation. So never uh, a part of the substrate is uh, uh, connected and oriented to the right side. Because as I showed you initially, um, the second part of the substrate is oriented to the other side. So therefore, that might be um, um, not very susceptible to um, hydrolysis and leading to an irreversible inhibition. This shows um, this, the same uh, mechanism again for uh, 
certain uh, situation with uh, proline and leucine, and this is a covalent docking approach that we made, and uh, so uh, the uh, corresponding um, uh, connection um, uh, of the active site cysteine forming the uh, uh, single bond to the uh, uh, car uh, carbamate carbon is over here, and of course the two amino acids interacting with the corresponding binding site. And then we did an overlay with uh, uh, the uh, corresponding um, known um, um, complex, known from X-ray crystallography of this uh, CA64 inhibitor that I have mentioned before. Now this is CA030 because uh, uh, it's a little bit different here. At the acyl ester structure not important. And you can see a very nice overlay uh, that confirm in a way this postulated complex. So what we could finally state here is that our uh, um, compounds uh, in contrast to the acyl enzyme that is formed in the case of a substrate conversion, where we had this covalent bond uh, to the acyl group that is oriented to the um, non-primed side of the active site. In our case, we have this unexpected and kind of novel orientation of the dipeptide portion uh, in the, into the uh, primed uh, binding site of the enzyme. And we think that this is a quite novel and interesting approach to go forward. So uh, finally, I would like to thank some of my uh, co-workers who did the job. This is a, was a huge pro project, it's nearly done now. And uh, a lot of work was done by Christian Breuer, who is over here. By the way, this is Dr. Ciani, uh, he, who uh, also joined our lab uh, for a very nice collaboration time. I really, uh, uh, I really appreciate this opportunity to have him in Bonn. Uh, and then uh, also some work has been, a lot of work has been done by Karina Lemke over here and by Jim, Kup Jim Kupos, who is here. And uh, I also have to thank for financial support. And I should also mention Anna Christina Schulz-Finke, who is not on the picture. Uh, Anna Christina is seen over here. And this is our group uh, on the boat. And finally, I would like to thank you. Uh, next to my colleagues, I would like to thank you for your kind of attention. Oh, great. Oh, hello. Um, always love to see a meeting start off with cathepsins. I never see that, so thank you for that. Um, I guess my, my, my simple question is, have you looked at how these inhibitors bind across different pH ranges? Because we understand that cathepsin active site kind of changes at different pH, and how does that change the efficacy, if at all? Uh, we, we did that. Um, so what we did first, we changed pH and run the assay. And so we felt that in case of catepsin B, when we lowered the pH, the enzyme becomes kind of unstable and the progress curves didn't look like very nice at pH 4. And so from this point of view, it was not so easy to determine uh, in inhibition constants because the enzyme behaved a little bit unexpectedly not nice. Anyway, um, then we uh, looked at the inhibitors alone at different pH, this was mainly the question, what happens, and there's a clear answer. Uh, if you go to acidic conditions, nothing happens, they, they are stable. But if you go to rather basic conditions, the inhibitors becoming a little bit less stable, and this is because of this mechanism that can also occur in solution without enzyme. So carbamates are susceptible to a EC1 mechanism, so if you deprotonate them, then you would receive uh, the opportunity that they're, that they are uh, uh, getting cleaved without enzyme. So the answer is basic conditions reduce the stability of the inhibitors. How basic? I mean, just 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 above seven or between seven and eight. Like how basic before you see that happen? So you should not go beyond eight. Uh, do we have any other questions?
So, Professor, uh, did you ever try to use different moiety to get the loop? Like you just saw carboxylate. Did you ever try to, because carboxylate somehow will be also dependent on your pH. So did you ever try to see if you can insert some like base oster that? No, we did not, we did not do that. I think nobody did it. Um, however, uh, of course there are opportunities in medicinal chemistry to replace a carboxylate by a corresponding uh, relative structure. For example, tetrasol is a very nice replacement for uh, for carboxylate, so why not introducing a uh, tetrasol at the C-terminal part? That would be a nice, nice idea. No, we did not. I think nobody did that, but it's a good idea. Maybe you can make this compound. <laughs> Do we have any other questions? So. Uh, I just wanted to know if there is any other residue that activates the histidine, the ability of the histidine to capture the proton and pick up the proton from the uh, sulfidryl group. So this is a, a difficult question. So um, we didn't, initially we did not know um, what kind of active site moiety takes the, takes the proton, if at all. And then when this, we had this uh, methylation at the carbamate and the compound becomes completely less active, then we thought, okay, if the methylation led to a complete reduction of uh, activity, so the deprotonation seems to be crucial. Um, so from that, we seriously started to, to think about what is the uh, corresponding base. And then we, we, we uh, we gave this uh, uh, situation also to colleagues who did some kind of calculations on it. And they suggested us um, that it's uh, probably the active site cysteine that is acting as the base from their calculations. So I could not clearly uh, exclude the opportunity that the histidine that is involved in this um, acid-base equilibrium in the active side, so it's a very interesting discussion, uh, that the histidine takes the proton. Um, in this case, the effect would be the same. So from the, from the data, it could be the same. Uh, and so that is a kind of suggestion here, uh, unless we can uh, show the uh, uh, full calculations that are, uh, which I did not show here, which I did not, have with me um, that seems to support the cysteine to be the base in this process. It's a sophisticated situation. Uh, any other questions? I've, uh, uh, this is a, just a, a comment. Uh, catepsin B, it's just a beautiful protein. Because they, they, they is the protease that contain occluding loop that depend on the condition you can you can move. So a, a catepsin B that is carboxyl hyperpeptidase in one condition but is normal uh, endopeptidase in other. So the condition biological condition where catepsin B is. Um, control is activity. That is why it is quite uh, difficult to have uh, inhibitors for, for protein like that. Uh, this is beautiful molecule to do a lot of things as catepsin B do. This is a challenge for biology and for chemists to If I may, Peter, I would like to give a short comment to that. Um, it is true, of course. Uh, uh, and so the enzyme is in an equilibrium between the open and the closed conformation. Okay. So how fast this equilibrium might be changed is not known, and uh, the effects on, on the equilibrium are also not so easy to, to understand and to, to detect. Second, um, you might give different um, substrates. 
So if you would give a typical dipeptidase, uh, a carboxydipeptidase substrate, the substrate might trigger the equilibrium, and third, pH might trigger the equilibrium, and fourth, the inhibitor itself. If you would give an inhibitor that likes to interact with the closed conformation, wouldn't that influence the equilibrium to shift the equilibrium to the closed conformation? So you have four equilibria in this situation, and this makes, the, and I wanted to show this, and then I started uh, sometimes, and I wanted to make a, a few slides out of this, and, then, and I realized that it's so sophisticated and, and so many uh, unknown uh, details in this um, multiple play of equilibria, um, but your point is absolutely right. Okay, I think it's uh, time, we've had some great questions, uh, so I think it's time to move on to the next speaker. Um, So uh, the, the next speaker is Professor M Manuel Amarin uh, Lopez, or is it Lopez? Lopez, sorry, yes, I so gave the South American uh, pronunciation. So Professor Man Manuel Amarin Lopez um, received his bachelor's and PhD degrees from the Universidad de Santiago de Compostela in Spain, where he's currently a professor. His research interests are biological and medicinal chemistry, functional materials, and synthetic methodologies for synthetic for sustainable development. Professor Lopez will present uh, the work uh, Cyclic Peptide Nanotubes, Designs for Materials and Biological Applications. Thanks a lot for your kind attention. Um, First of all, I, I would like to give the thanks to the organizing committee for this great opportunity to come to here and to show part of our research. Well, there is a lot of uh, strategies to prepare uh, nanotubes, but if we retreat to the field of the peptide nanotubes, our strategy is based in the stacking, in the stacking of cyclopeptides. The first cyclopeptides was prepared in the group of Professor Gadiri, and they are formed by an even number of alpha amino acids with alter, alternated uh, chirality. This alternation permit uh, allowed to the cyclopeptides to adopt a flask conformation. And then it's possible the formation of hydrogen bonds uh, between the different subunits. The inner side is controlled by the number of cyclopeptides. And the oxide properties depend or are function from the alpha amino acids that we use in the synthesis. But this design with alpha amino acids has a big limitation that is it's not possible to modulate the inner properties without to destroy the same assembly process. For this reason, we started a few times ago a project when we replaced uh, half of the alpha amino acids by uh, gamma amino acids. Why? Because now we have the beta uh, carbon oriented to the inner cavity, and then we can modulate the properties. You use cyclic gamma amino acids. Why? Because um, the entropy penalty that we pay now is much less. Well, we have to uh, choose the right chirality, and in the design, we can see that the gamma amino acids, the NH, and the carbonyl group are oriented one to one phase, and the carbonyl group and NH of the alpha amino acids are oriented to the other phase. One clear application of the designs is to develop uh, channel, uh, lipid channels that can transport uh, the protons and the ions selectively. We prepare different uh, cyclopeptides with uh, tryptophans and leucines because these uh, amino acids give solubility to the peptides in the lipid villagers. These uh, exapeptides can form nanotubes and is able to transport protons, but it's too small to transport sodium and potassium. This other cyclopeptide formed by a amino acid can transport sodium and potassium quite easy and with a slightly selectivity for this transport of sodium over potassium. Uh, this selecti this sele transport selectivity is quite poor. We try to develop other uh, approach. For example, the design of uh, venturi light peptide nanotubes. In this case, we have uh, two different cyclopeptides attached by the covalent bond. This is like a funnel. One a peptide is a peptide with a proper yield group. And the other peptide is a tetrapeptide with a cider group. Then we can combine this, uh, this two peptides covalent through a free chemical reaction. 
Well, when the interaction between the octapeptides, we have a hydrogen bond, then the interaction is quite strong. Interaction that can form the tetrapeptides is smaller. If we are working at low concentration or with a medium that is a little polar, we only have this kind of capsules. But we increase the, uh, the polar, uh, we increase the concentration or the polarity of the medium, we can form nanotubes. Before to explain the properties of this whole system, I'm going to explain a little bit the properties of the tetrapeptide and the octapeptide. The tetrapeptide can form only dimers because one phase is blocked by the cygas. This equilibrium between the monomer and the dimer is very fast in the NMR time scala. This is the reason because only see, we only see one NH, not two NH. When we increase the concentration, we saw the formation of the dimer. Uh, we can see it by the NH, they shifted to a uh, high field, low, low field, sorry. If we do a, a Bahnhof analysis, when we uh, analyze the NH shifted with the concentration and with the temperatures, we can calculate the thermodynamic parameters of the system that we have here. The cost association of this is about 300 molar minus one. The octapeptide has a set of four NH that are independent of the concentration and the, the temperature. The meaning of this is we have a Ki higher than 10 to the 5 molar minus 1. The reason because we have four NH is because this peptide has a C2 symmetry. And then, it's, uh, and then we have two different NH. At the same time, it's possible to form two different uh, dimers. One, when the gamma amino acids with the propagyl groups is faced to the gamma amino acids with the propagyl group. And the other, when the gamma amino acids with the propagyl group is faced to the other gamma amino acid that is with the methyl group. Well, when we have the whole system, we can see the four NAs that come from, from the octapeptide. But now the tetrapeptide has two NAs because the symmetry of this tetrapeptide now is C2. When we work, when we move to high concentration that is about four molar, uh, four molar we can see that these NAs are shifted to a, a low field. Then it's evidence, evidence that we have the formation of the nanotube. When, when we reduce the concentration, we can see that the NH are shifted to, um, to a high, a high field. And then we can see the formation of only this species. We try to analyze the constant association of this uh, process, but it's quite difficult because it's, it's quite difficult because uh, the concentration of uh, four molar uh, um, is started to precipitate. But analyzing the displacements of this NH and compared with the theta peptide, we can see that the constant association is about 300. Other approach to get a good selectivity is the inner functionalization. For example, with gamma amino acids that contain a hydroxyl group. This gamma amino acid was prepared easily from the digital loads. Before to study the nanotube, we st studied the dimers. The dimers we can consider the smaller nanotube. And for this, we only need to block the amino acids uh, oriented to one phase is replacing the uh, NH, NH by a methyl group. The first amino acid, that, the first cyclopeptide that we prepared was this cyclopeptide formed by four leucines, two gamma amino acids, and two gamma amino acids with the hydroxyl group protected like benzene oriented to the inner cavity. In this case, like this peptide has a C2 symmetry, it's possible the formation of two dimers. One that we call a clisset, where the gamma amino acids with the BNC group is phased to the gamma amino acids with the BNC group. And the, uh, and the other, the alternative form, is the one when the gamma amino acids with the BNC group is related to the gamma amino acid that is uh, on, uh, only with the hydrogens here. We can see a set of four uh, NAs that come from, from both peptides. By 2D NMR analysis, we can see the, uh, the ratio between these two diamonds is 2 to 1. The eclipse form is in, in, high, in high concentration that the, that the alternated. Other proof that they will have this system was the X-ray structure. We find that in the X-ray structure, we only have the alternating form when the benzyl groups are in the inner cavity. Well, the next step was to remove the benzyl groups, and now we have the hydrocils inside the cavity. We can see that we can form, again, two different dimers. 
when we study this system at room temperatures, we can see by the NH that is folded. When we reduce the temperature, we can see the formation of, uh, two, of the two dimers. A very interesting uh, experiment was, was at room temperature, we had a very small amount of a polar molecule that methan methanol, we can see the formation of the diamond form. By uh, 2D NMR analysis, uh, we saw that this dimer is the alternated. This is a clear evidence that we have a very polar cavity. Uh, that we have here the hydroxyl groups, we can add other functionalizations, like for example, pyridines. We add one pyridine. The reason because we, only only we have only one is because the cavity is too small to have two. Now we have broken the C2 symmetry and we can form four different um, dimers. You can see the area of the NH is quite complicated. But if we are a silver soil, we can see the uh, we can see that with half equivalent per cyclopeptide, one equivalent for dimer, we see the formation of mainly one dimer. By 2D NMR analysis, we showed that uh, we we found that the dimer that is formed mainly is the one when the pyridine is the gamma amino acids with the pyridine is faced with the gamma amino acids with the pyridine. Similar results we get when we add oxalic acid to this system. It's able to encapsulate the oxalic acid and we have a similar behavior. Well, if we change the, the hydroxyl group, introduce uh, acid, we can encapsulate it, the cisplatin derivates and form uh, a capsule that protect the cisplatin from the medium. In this design, we increase the size. We have 10 amino acids in order to get enough cavity for uh, the, this, uh, the platin derivate, the cisplatin derivate. And at the same time, we add a peg because we need, uh, with this peg, we have enough solubility, solubility for uh, uh, studies, biological studies. We tested this uh, new capsule with uh, lung, breast, no, breast, lung, and ovarian cancer cells, a normal sense. And we found a promising activity with ovarian cancer cell. And the more interesting result is was when we tested with uh, um, ovarian cancer cell resistant to cisplatin, we have similar activity. This is a clear evidence that the cisplatin is protected from the medium. If we, uh, if we do a step forward with this system, we can prepare capsules. For this, we think in a psychopeptide and one that we can add a cap. If we add a cap, we can form half a sphere and the whole sphere will be our capsule that we can recognize presentate ligands. We think that the cyclopeptide can be a octapeptide with hydrazine in the, in, for the uh, covalent uh, uh, coupling with the uh, pyridine that could be our recognizing motif. The formation uh, between this, the aldehyde and the hydrazine, we can form a hydrazone. This is a covalent dynamic bond, like osines or imines, and it's very useful in supramolecular chemistry because we can break easy or form easy. The key step in the synthesis of this cyclopeptide was to prepare the gamma amino acids with a uh, acid group. This acid group during the synthesis was, uh, in, was transformed in the hydrazine. The um, um, pyridine was synthesized in, uh, stand, in standard, con, standard conditions. This is reported in the literature. We get the whole system and we studied the encapsulation of different pyridines and pyridines using UV and following the Sorensen band. When you have only monopyridines, the monopyridine is outside. But when we use bipyridines, these go inside. And we found that the best pyridines are around 16 uh, angstroms. We, do, we, can do, we can do NMR studies with the pyridines inside, and we found the noise that confirmed that our uh, uh, pyridines are inside of the cavity. We can do it, competition experiments, and they work very well when the constant association between the ligands is, a, is, is, is high. But when, for example, we have the ligand pi that has a very high constant association, we cannot replace by the ligand four, as I show here, because it's a better, it's a slightly better, the distance is slightly better, I have a little higher constant. It's about 10 to the, 10 to the eight, molar minus one. 
Well, then how we can liberate uh, this uh, this ligand? Well, if you are at a hydroxylamine, uh, um, this can form a zinc that is stronger than this other bond. And then now we broke the capsule and we can liberate the ligand. And we can follow it by, by UV. Well, we are interested in very large uh, uh, cavities. And we think, how we can do it? Well, we started the alpha amino acids, and maybe we can introduce a spacer between the alpha amino acids. For this, we think in delta amino acids. Again, cyclic, because the cyclic, like I commented before, allow us uh, to pay less uh, entropy penalty. Well, before to, uh, to comment on you all, uh, all our results, I would like to comment a little bit how is the design. In this case, when we have alpha amino acids, uh, when we have alpha amino acids or gamma amino acids, there is an uh, odd number of carbons between the carbonyl and NH. But when we have delta amino acids, we have an even number of carbons between the carbonyl and NH. The meaning of this is when we have the alpha amino acids, both carbonyl and the, the NH, or in this case, protected like methyl, is oriented to the same phase. But the gamma amino acids, you can see like the delta amino acids, the carbonyl is one side and the NH is to the other side. Then we cannot do an alternating uh, uh, methylation, non-methylation, you can, we cannot do this. If we want to block one phase, we have two. The methylated, the gamma amino acids, that is before to the alpha amino acids. Well, we prepare a tamer from a, for a tetamer, alpha tetamer, a twelmer for a summer, and a systemer for a, a, a tamer. With the tamer, we found that the NH has shifted to a high field. This is a evidence that this uh, cyclopeptide is not involved in a cell assembly process, then we have only the cyclopeptide. But with the 12 mesh and with the uh, summer, we can see that the NH assists to uh, low field. This is evidence that we have the formation of the cell assembly process. We confirm this, the formation of the, of the dimer, uh, through the, the noise that assists that exists in the NMR, that we found in the NMR. Until now, I show you all the process of cell assembling are in a bet, in a uh, anti-parallel beta shift resistor. But we know by the literature for our words that um, it's possible the formation of the parallel beta sheet. Um, for um, we did the theoretical calculations and we found that the parallel beta sheet in this case will be more stable than the anti-parallel. For this reason, we need to to experimentally check it. We have this octamer and we prepare the enantomer. In order to, dis to, to distinguish both in the NMR, we change this methyl group of the tyrosine by the benzyl group of the tyrosine. We can see that the NMR I quite different, I quite similar, and only the difference is the benzyl group or the, the methyl group. That is uh, the benzyl group of the of the, um, the enantiomer. When we miss, when we start from one enantiomer and we add the second enantiomer, we see new signals in the NH. Does this correspond to a new, uh, a new system? That is the heterodimer formed by one cyclopeptide and the other. This allows us to combine different uh, peptides with different properties. And this is what's confirmed by the NH inside of the ring and by the noise in the uh, lateral uh, side chains. Well, with these results in hands, we say to test what happened with the octamer. Well, we prepared the enantiomer again with the same strategy, and we saw they have the similar, uh, the similar NMR with the NH that are not forming, uh, confirmed that are not forming a dimer. But when we miss, when we add the one dimer the, to the dimer, we add the enantiomer, we saw like the NH disappear and appear a new NH that are evidencing that the, there is a cell assembly process. This NH is quite broad. Maybe because the equilibrium is quite fast in the NMR time scala, or because the um, interaction between the hydrogen bonds is not in the right ge geometry. We think that the these cyclopeptides have a curved shape, and then it's not possible the formation of the, of the dimer 
when they are with the biosel, the parallel, the antiparallel beta sheet. But they can form the antiparallel beta sheet. Well, we decided to study the nanotubes. For that, we prepared this octamer without any methylation, any block in the in phase. And we choose uh, arginine for the deposition over mica. And the rest of the amino acids are selected for a good solubility mainly. Well, when we uh, dissolve the cyclopeptide in basic medium and in acid medium, we check the formation of uh, the nanotubes. For that, we use this teoflavin glide sensor because the teoflavin can insert it in the beta sheet and his, uh, uh, its uh, spectral emission changes. At pH, when we increase the amount of the nanotubes, we don't see the formation of the, of the, the, the cyclopeptide. When we increase the concentration of the cyclopeptide, we don't see the formation of the nanotubes. Maybe because the side chains are protonated and there is a repulsion between the, the cyclopeptides. But when at, in a basic medium, when we increase the concentration of the cyclopeptide, we see the formation of the nanotube. These nanotubes were deposited on over mica, and we can see the very large uh, uh, nanotubes, about four micas, and with the diameter of 3.5 uh, nanometers. Well, we uh, thought that uh, this, this cyclopeptide uh, for the site and the hydrophobicity, hydrophobicity of the cavity, we can encapsulate the molecules like C60. Like is reported in other articles, that's in the proteins that encapsulate the C60 or even carbon nanotubes. Well, we prepare solutions at acid and basic uh, pH with the peptide, uh, with the C60 alone, with the peptide alone, and with the C CP and the C60 uh, together. As uh, acid pH, we don't see the solubilization of the, of the fullerene. But at basic pH, we can see the, that the uh, nanotubes are forming and they solubilize the C60. And the, for example, when we have the experiment, the cubet, we like the precipitate disappear. Well, we deposit of these nanotubes over mica, and we see that the diameter of these nanotubes is the same. Then this is uh, evidence that the, the fullerene is inside. Other evidence is that these fullerenes have a, a few um, fluorescent, this is cofocal imagines, and we thought that these uh, fullerenes came from the, the, um, the C60. A very interesting experiment when we, when we repeat these uh, studies with the C70, we, don't show, we didn't show the solubilization of the, of the C70. Well, finally, I would like to comment a little bit other projects that we are involved in. When we have cyclopeptides with a, uh, the with hydrophobic part, hydrophilic part, they can form nanotubes uh, in the presence of a lipid villager. There is many different mechanisms report, but like the barrel port, but uh, the results are more agreed with a carpet like mechanism. Then the hydrophobic part is inserted, uh, the cyclopeptide, the nanotubes, is formed parallel to the membrane, and the hydrophobic part is inserted inside the, the lipid. And this broke the homeostasis equilibrium of the cyclopeptides. Until now, the, the mechanic, the peptides that we have prepared, or the nanotubes for this application, has a very li high limitation, the solubility and the toxicity. Why? The hydrophobic part is responsible for the activity, but the toxicity too. The hydrophilic part is uh, responsible of the selectivity and the toxicity. If we can get uh, peptides with, with solubility and low toxicity, we need to increase the hydrophilic part and reduce the hydrophobic part. Uh, usually this uh, hydrophilic part is charged is with positive charges because the, and the bacterial membranes are mainly enriched in negative charge. We decided to use only two uh, hydrophobic uh, um, amino acids, one tryptophan and other, a, uh, a other, the propagylicin, in order to introduce different carbon tails to increase the interaction of the cyclopeptides with the lipid membranes. At the same time, we use a, a lysine to introduce this hydroxylamine in order to add uh, different um, um, sugars, because it reported that the sugars reduce the toxicity and increase the um, 
the selectivity. Well, this was the first uh, successful platform when easy to prepare, easy to synthesis, after the synthesis, easy to add different tails, different sugars. Well, this table uh, represents uh, the different amino acids that we prepare, different cyclopeptides that we prepare from this uh, platform. We found that the carbon tails better are between 10 and, um, and 14 carbons. With the gram negative, they have pretty good activity. With the gram, pos the gram positive, sorry, with the gram positive bacteria, they have pretty good activity. With the gram negative, the, um, the activity is not so good. But we found that this peptide is very, very soluble. We don't need to add a co-solvent like DMSO. And we find that at the same time, that is very low, has very low toxicity. And we don't need this because when we add um, a sugar, the activity the, of the cyclopeptide is reduced. Then we change this amino acid for others like arginine or uh, derivate from the lysines with, with, lysines with less carbons. With these platforms, we find again that the best activity are related between 10 and 14 carbon uh, tails. We found with the gram neg uh, negative, uh, gram positive, sorry, with the gram positive, very good activity. With the gram negative, uh, we increase a little bit the, this activity. And not have here the next table because uh, they are very preliminary results. But with next platforms that we call C, not A, uh, we found in the gram negative similar activities that in gram positives. Finally, I will give the thanks to my main collaborator, Juan Granja, people who is working in part of this project and others, and people who has uh, left the lab recently, and other collaborators who is working with us in computational, doing the cancer uh, assays or the uh, antimicrobial assays. I would like to give the thanks to the financial support shoots. And before the questions, I would like to comment that I'm from Santiago de Compostela, that is very, it's a medieval city that is very famous for the huge cathedral that the tradition say that here is Santiago, one of the, or Jacobus, one of the passes of Jesus. And it's very famous because the people came to here walking. This area, this is Galicia, this is northwest of Spain, north to Portugal, is famous too for the shape of the coast and for the marisco seafood. And thanks a lot for your kind attention. Oh, thank you, Professor Amarine, for a very interesting talk. I loved some of those molecules. They're just uh, works of art. So I think the uh, floor is open to for some questions now. So uh, anyone's got some questions, fire away. Professor Maureen, uh, very nice talk and congratulations. My, my question is regarding the kinetics uh, for the liberation of the drug. Have you guys have seen some curves how how of uh, half lifetime yes for this kind of nanotubes? Yes, uh, you have some kinetic studies for to control to see how how long to. Live. We don't have kinetics. We are working with this. The important is the selectivity, because it's um, how we say if you go the drug go to the right place, then the liberation usually is a matter of time, because here is a. Um, uh, it's a basic medium, it's in, in, or acid medium is in changing. The platinum is liberated. Uh, I, we are continuing with this work, but uh, with all, we like to continue with all of this presentation. We have other projects, but we don't have enough hands in the lab. Thank you. So, do you have any explanation for the different selectivity of these microcycles against Staphylococcus aureus and uh, the other is uh, Epidermidis? The lipidomic? Uh, lipidomic is a really challenge. You can find that one peptide is really good for one bacteria and really bad for other. Is uh, one challenge today is to understand how is the lipidomic of the cells and the bacteria. So you nicely showed that you can open the connection uh, of 
part of the molecules by adding this O benzyl hydroxyl amine and then you're cleaving the hydrosome bond. And is this because you have used this O benzyl hydroxyl amine in excess? Or is it because of thermodynamic reasons? Yeah. It's driven by thermodynamics of yeah. the formation of the NC double bond? Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah, is this thermodynamic? This is more stable than this one. Uh, you can play with imines that are really, really very unstable. For example, with the peptide design that I showed in the last slides, we are adding other molecules in the, in the site, in the site chains with other activities. And for example, when we tested with, uh, with this, with this lamine, we found that they are not liberated when arrived to the target. Then now we are working, will be tested in the next months, with changing this, uh, this hydrazylamines by formation of hydrazones because they are more, uh, more unstable. I, am, I, I was wondering the effect of your compounds on endothelium, endothelial cells. Endothelial, and, and, and endothelial cells inside the, the vessel on the, because uh, you, you interfere with the surface of the cell. Uh, I'm wondering if you have some effect on the coagulation process. This is a very important, sometimes more important in cancer when you block the, the blood supply then act directly on the cancer cell. So many of this kind of, uh, of structure, uh, I was wondering some uh, lesion on endothelial cell. What is my suggestion? Yeah. Uh, I don't know, but um, with the previous, the preliminary um, cyclopatite was were designed for uh, anti mercabian activity. The problem was that when they were injected in the in the mouse, they aggregated. Um, they were not uh, good. Uh, they have uh, aggregation, I think, with the parin and problems for the solubility. Probably they are interfering with other proteins and other uh, tissues. I don't know if this is your your point of view. Uh, do we have any more questions? Okay, oh, sorry. you have uh, another question, do you? Yeah, oh. sorry. Is it possible to diffuse some chemicals inside and see if it has have some hydrolytic activity like a uh, uh, proteasome? Model. Protections inside of the nano. Well, they, we have. This one of the that we are working on with catalysis. Um, for example, I didn't show here, but we have other other work that we already have published, and we encapsulated different molecules. For example, here, for example, xenon. We have we have uh, in states of pyridine. We in states of Porphyrin, we have a pyridines. We have pyridines in that in the here. We can isolate xenon. We published uh, one month or two months ago, and we find that uh, it's possible to isolate. Okay. And with catalysis, we are working on that. For the moment, we don't have good results. In other case, I will present. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, we, we, this is one of, of our challenges now. Do you have some study about the, the colon uh, uh, formation? If your compounds is able to prevent the colon formation or break in the, the, the colonies in the micro antimicrobial studies, in for instance? Yeah. Yeah, we have we did a uh, couple of experiments with that that will be included in the manuscript that we are preparing, and we found that when we have a biofilm and we are dispetize, the biofilm don't grow, but I, with it, but the bacteria the biofilm is not killed. Uh, 
Okay, uh, if, there, if there are no more questions, let's just thank Professor Amorine again. And um, I think we've got some uh, refreshments here. Um, I think it looks like we're five minutes ahead of schedule. Yes, we'll be back, start back at uh, 11 o'clock. But we say we've got to, and if anyone needs a bio break or anything like that, this would be a good time to take it.